Good morning. Happy Sabbath to all of you. It's good to be here in our church family, isn't it? It's good to have each other praying for one another. And, you know, with all the sickness and illnesses and different things that happen in this world and death even, it's good to have support of brothers and sisters. But we all know that this life, no matter how long it is, is a blink in uh, God's eye. It's just like that. God has an eternal plan for us, though. And I don't look forward to that. Today, our, our topic is the third day. As we read the New Testament, one very striking detail that stands out is that Jesus taught as no man has ever taught. Many of his teachings left the hearers sort of scratching their heads. I had to be careful. I went to the dermatologist this week and then had a couple wounds here. But anyway, it left a lot of people scratching their head as to what he was really talking about. Because Jesus would teach in parables and then he would have object lessons. He often used uh, parables for several purposes. They were stories that could be easily remembered and they taught great spiritual truths. That in itself presented problems that many of the people that were lis listening to him were thinking literally. And Jesus was always thinking and speaking spiritually. When Jesus taught in parables, he was actually fulfilling the prophecy of the Old Testament. I don't know if you uh, have ever read some of the text, but Ezekiel 20, verse 49, says, Then I said, Ah, Lord God, they say of me, does he not speak parables? And then Psalm 78 verse 2 says, I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old. And then the third verse, Ezekiel 17 verse 2. Son of man, pose a riddle and speak a parable to the house of Israel. At other times, Jesus used object lessons. For example, Jesus and the disciples came to the temple in Jerusalem where everyone was in awe of the temple's great beauty and grandeur, which took thousands of men 46 years to build. And here Jesus makes a fairly confusing pronouncement to these people that were around him. John's second uh, chapter records this. Verse 9 it says, Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. That sort of blew their mind. It took thousands of men, 46 years to build it, and Jesus says, destroy it. Three days I'll build it back. Verse 20, though, we right? have to keep reading. Then the Jews says, it's taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? Like, they're ever basically saying you're crazy. <laughs> but, verse 21 says, but he, Jesus, was speaking of the temple of his body. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, listen, they, the, even the disciples did not understand it immediately. When Jesus had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. It's evident from this scripture that the people... Even the disciples were often thinking literally, and Jesus was speaking spiritually. This illustrates a very important component and principles that we need to exercise when we study God's Word. We need to be careful not to fall into that same trap of literal understandings. But we should be thinking spiritually when we read God's Word, always. You see, this same fallacy is one of the main reasons that there's so many different Christian denominations out there, so many different beliefs, because people are reading the Bible literally, and there are spiritual lessons and, and uh, truths that we have to understand. Now, most of you, have, have you ever heard of a man named Louis Weir, W-E-R-E? -E? I thought so. Well... Lewis Weir was an Australian Adventist evangelist 
And he wrote a number of exegetical books. I know what you, you're thinking. What in the world is an exegetical book? Because we don't use that terminology very often. Exegetical means the critical explanation or interpretation of a text, especially of Scripture. Then it says, put simply, it's the process of discovering the original and intended meaning of a passage of Scripture. And so a lot of problems that we have in the Christian world today is a problem of correctly interpreting the Bible. And Lewis Weir, he, did some, he was an outstanding Bible student. He compiled a list of Bible laws, L-A-W-S, governing the proper interpretation of Scripture. Just as there are laws governing nature, God has laws governing the proper interpretation of Scripture. And one of these principles we're going to look at today is the law of the local that is uh, the worldwide symbolized by the local. And I'll explain that a little bit. For example, if you use the city of the word or the term Babylon to illustrate the condition of the entire world at the end of time, you have to go back to the Old Testament and learn about Babylon. And so as we study Revelation and we study Babylon, you don't know what it is unless we go back and study the Old Testament. The same is true with all the other Old Testament symbols such as Jezebel. Well, Jezebel wasn't living in John the Revelator's day. Uh, the Euphrates River was not prominent not like it was uh, in the uh, Genesis. And so to properly understand the symbols in Revelation, we have to go back to the Old Testament and understand these things. Uh, a point that illustrates this very thing comes to us from the great controversy. It says, Christ saw in Jerusalem a symbol of the world. Now there's many symbols in the, in the Bible, but listening to, to this, and this is just one example, Christ saw in Jerusalem a symbol of the world, hastening on to meet the retributive judgments of God. The Savior's prophecy concerning the visitation of judgments upon Jerusalem is to have, what? Another fulfillment, the doom of a world. Isaiah 14, 26 takes you uh, up this same premise here. And the title of this is Assyria Destroyed. It says, this is the purpose that is purposed against the whole earth. That is, the things of Syria that happened to them back in the Bible days will happen again, but it will happen on the entire world. Let's read that again. This is the purpose that is purposed against the whole earth. And this is the hand that is stretched out over all the nations. For the Lord of hosts has purposed, and who will annul it? His hand is stretched out, and who will turn it back? So in other words, in today's sermon, uh, I should have prefaced it a little bit, it requires a lot of deep thought. I mean, it's not something that, you know, just light and everything, and we can just catch every third word, and we're, we're okay. It's very heavy thoughts that we have to, to think about. And so the, the prophecies that we find in prophetic books such as Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel often have a local fulfillment and then they have a worldwide fulfillment in the last days. And so we could spend a lot of, about the, this Bible principle uh, today, but we're going to be studying just a little segment on the third day. You see, God seeks to tell people things that are going to happen, and he speaks to us through Jesus and the prophets in spiritual languages and symbols and prophecies. They're not easily understood. 1 Corinthians 2.14, it says, But the natural man does what? Does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. For they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. The, the things of God are spiritually discerned. God wants us to be like the Bereans in the New Testament, who search the scriptures daily, and so we must look for the spiritual meanings of the scriptures as well. Otherwise, and you know uh, the story about Nicodemus in the Bible? Nicodemus was a smart man. He had a Ph.D. The Bible doesn't say that, but he, 
he was one of the most educated people uh, in, in that community in Jerusalem. And yet, when Jesus talked to him, Jesus was speaking here, and he was listening down here. And so one of Nicodemus' primary questions when Jesus told him a man must be born again, what was Nicodemus thinking? Too big to get back in that my mama's womb, you know. <laughs> they were not on the same wavelength. He was thinking literally. Jesus was thinking spiritually. And so this premise is something that we need to carry through with all of our Bible study. God wants us to search and dig for these truths in much the same manner as people dig for a hidden treasure. Colossians 2, 3. It says, in him, that is Jesus, all the treasures of divine wisdom. And the Amplified Bible says that comprehensive insight into the ways and purposes of God. That's enough to expand our brain a little bit, isn't it? And all the riches of spiritual knowledge and enlightenment are stored up and lie hidden. But God wants us to dig out, just like you, a miner would dig gold and, and diamonds and, and different treasures out of the earth. God wants us to dig treasures out of his word. Now, for anyone that's read the Bible very much, the third day Bible reference stands out. The third day occurs, and I'm going to have a number here. I want you to just use your imagination, imagination for just a second as to how many times the word or the term third day appears in the Bible. Okay, everybody got a number in their mind? The term third day occurs 58 times in the Bible. 39 of those times are in the Old Testament, 19 times in the New Testament. And a closer related term three days, it occurs over 70 times in the Bible. And so the, when I think of the third day, I often, about the first text that, uh, that comes to my mind is the prophecy that Jesus made about his resurrection on the third day after his death. Now we're going to look at two texts here that uh, ties into the rest of our, our study today. Psalm 90 verse 4. It says, for a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday, that is like one day, when it is past and like a watch in the night. Second Peter 3.8 is a New Testament verse that's very similar. Peter says, but beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years. How would you like to have God's viewpoint of time? Mm. And a thousand years is one day. <clears throat> now, the crux of our, or the uh, meat of our study today is that some theologians believe that God has given mankind a spiritual week for the purpose of redemption. That is, from creation to recreation, redemption. And that they view the, uh, the, the creation week also as a redemption week. That is, there are six prophetic days or 6,000 years, one day equal 1,000 years. And that God has given man 6,000 years to repent and to follow Jesus before probation closes. And then the 7,000th year that we know as a Sabbath is, will be the millennium. And so Jesus came at 4,000 years after creation. That leaves 2,000 years. And what year are we in? We're in 2023. Something to keep in mind here. Preachers such as Doug Batchelor and many Christians, including me, believe that there is Bible evidence to support a 6,000-year-old plan of redemption. No, we're, we're not 100% positive. I wouldn't stake my life on it or anything. But I think there is credibility in this, this premise that God will have 6,000 years for the plan of redemption. We're going to study a little bit about this, and we ought to just always keep an open mind, and at the same time, put a question mark in there, is, is this true or this not? Matthew 24, 33 says, So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the doors. And so Jesus wants us to be aware and alert to his second coming. He doesn't want to jump out of the bushes and say, Boo, I'm here. He wants us to be alert and ready for his coming. 
there's an article from Signs of the Time and written by you know who, Sister White. She says here, the idea that certain portions of the Bible cannot be understood has led to neglect of some of its most important truths. You know, we have a tendency to just study some basic things in the Bible and a lot of stuff we don't study that much. She goes further. She says, the mysteries of the Bible are not such because God has sought to conceal truth. The limitation is not its purpose, but in what? Our capacity. Of those very portions of Scripture so often passed by as impossible to be understood, listen to this now. God desires us to understand as much as our minds are capable of receiving. Wow. Wow. God wants us to understand these things that when we read them, we, we scratch our heads, just like Nicodemus and the disciples and all this. He wants us to think about it and study the uh, scriptures. Now, here gives me some consolation in my studies. You, do you realize that even the great prophet Daniel studied the, the uh, scriptures trying to understand them, and God wants us to do the same thing? Daniel had a hard time understanding the scriptures. In fact, angels had to come and explain the prophecies to him. Daniel. The disciples had a hard time understanding the prophecies. John the Revelator often did not fully understand what he saw and heard. The early Adventists would often search the scriptures throughout the night trying to understand the scriptures better and to know God's will for us. Even Ellen White and Joseph Bates and James White and many other early Adventists, they poured over their Bible hour after hour searching for treasures of understanding. Sometimes they were wrong in their initial conclusions. But as they studied more and more, clear light was given to them. For example, uh, in, in one of my previous sermons, I, I shared with you that both Joseph Bates and Ellen White believed for a time that the proper hours of the Sabbath was from 6 p.m. Friday to 6 p.m. Sabbath. But as this issue was studied, and the Bible definition of a day was studied, they changed, and those, so they used, utilized the Bible definition of from sunset to sunset as the sacred hours of the Sabbath. The bottom line of all this is that we all need to study. I know of no one, I say no one except Jesus that understood everything in the scriptures. Studying the scriptures is a lifetime of growth and we may sometimes have errors in our understanding. But God will bless everyone who diligently studies his word. Now, we're going to look at some illustrations. I told you about the third day, the 2,000 years, and then the third day would be the millennium. We're going to study about that and look at some Old Testament scriptures to see if it points forward to that. May or may not, but let's look at it. The first illustration comes to us from 2 Kings 20, verse 5. Let's look at it and see what it says. It says, Return and tell Hezekiah, the leader of my people, thus says the Lord, the God of David, your father, I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. Surely I will heal you. And then this prophecy says something out of the blue. On the third day you shall go up to the house of the Lord. Where in the world did that come from? Huh. Or could that be looking for the second coming here when we will meet the Lord? Well, it's very clear that during this period of time, it says that God's people poured out their hearts in prayer. They repented that God heard their prayer. He healed them and he restored them. And they were to be with him. It says that you shall go up to the house of the Lord on the third day. Or oh, that's very interesting. Let's look at another text. That was from uh, 2 Kings. This was from the book Hosea, the 6th chapter, verses 1 to 3. And the, the title in the Bible says, A Call to Repentance. 
Come and let us return to the Lord, for He has torn, but He will heal us. He has stricken, but He will bind us up. Listen to this. After what? After two days, He will revive us. What is this talking about? On the third day, He will raise us up, that we may live in His sight. Let us know, let us pursue, pursue the knowledge of the Lord. His going forth is established as the morning. He will come to us like the rain, like the latter and former rain to the earth. Now when it's talking about on the third day, he will raise us up that we may live in his sight. That reminds me of 1 Thessalonians 4.16, where it says, the for, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with a trumpet of God, and the dead will, what? Dead in Christ will rise first. So, God wants us to repent. He wants us to return to a true worship of Him. And He's promised to heal us. He's promised to restore us. Third illustration is Exodus 19.16. It says, Then it came to pass on the, what day? Third day. You know, a lot of times there's generalities in the Scriptures. But when God says something specifically like this, he's got a purpose in mind, and so it's up to us to try to understand that purpose. Then it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain. And the sound of the trumpet was very loud so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. The smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace and the whole mountain quaked greatly. Can you see some similarities here with the elements of the second coming? The scripture is very specific that this took place on the third day. Thunderings and lightnings, thick cloud, the trumpet blast, and the people were to meet God. I don't know about you, but when I've tried to envision all that happening, sort of chills run up my spine, as they say. Can you imagine there? All this, you know, the earth trembling like this, and all the, the, the thundering and lightning and all the power of God, and that we will be able to meet God only because of Jesus' shed blood. That's worth meditating on. Genesis 22, 2 through 4 has another one, Abraham and Isaac. It says, then he said, this is God, take your son, your only son, and so that rings a bell that it's pointing forward to Jesus, doesn't it? Whom you love, pointing forward to the only, uh, to Jesus whom the God the Father loved, go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Verse 3. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son. He split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place which God told him. Verse 4. Specific time. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw a place afar off. And Abraham called the place... Uh, the Lord will provide, as it is said to the day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. Yes, that's verse 14. So there's just no, absolutely no question that this is an acted out prophecy that was pointing forward to Jesus on this earth, and dying for us. But we have this reference also on the third day of seeing a place afar. Now we, we might, we don't use that term very much, seeing a place afar. But let's look at Hebrews eleven thirteen. and we have this phrase again. It says, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off were assured them. That is, they were looking forward to the second coming of Jesus as well. They embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Another illustration, John, the second chapter. On the what? On the third day. What? What does it matter what day it was? You know, God is sending us a message here when it with numbers. On the third day, there was a wedding. And the Bible speaks a lot about a wedding. 
a wedding with, and who's the bridegroom? Jesus, and the church is his bride. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. You and I have been invited to a wedding. And when they'd ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And I had more verses in here, but we have a limited amount of time to talk about it. But the point in is here that on the third day, Jesus is pointing out that there is the wedding. And wine in the Bible, there's two types of wine. It does, there's fresh wine that would just like you'd squeeze from the juice. And then there's fermented wine. What does fermented wine do? It takes you drunk. Jesus, he provided the fresh wine here, and it shocked everyone that was there. The wine represents doctrines and beliefs and truths. And Jesus, when he came down this earth, he came to bring truth. He came to bring fresh wine to us. Not fermented wine. That's the wine of Babylon. But he, he came to bring us fresh truth uh, to, to the people of this earth and reveal to them the character of God that was so distorted. Illustration number six here, Esther 5, 1 and 2. Esther 5, uh, okay, verse 1. It says, now it happened on the what? Third day that Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the king's palace across from the king's house while the king sat on his royal throne in the royal house facing the entrance of the house. So it was when the king saw Queen Esther standing in the court that she found favor in his sight. I want to find favor in the sight of a king, the king of kings and lord of lords. And the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. And then Esther went near and touched the top of his scepter. That is, she was accepted. And if you go back up to verse 1, it says that she was in her royal robes. This is the robes that the king had provided. She didn't bring her, she didn't go downtown and buy the best dress that she could or anything and wear that. This was a royal robe, just like Jesus has given us a royal robe to wear to the, the wedding, doesn't it? That's a robe of his righteousness. But there's going to be a, a, another banquet, and the king will inspect the guests, just like this king did. But she found favor. We hope to find favor just as she did. And so in concluding today, the third day may have some semblance to it. It may work out that after 2,000 years, Jesus will come. It may be incorrect. There are a lot of indications, though, in the Scripture that this may be a correct uh, interpretation. You see, William Miller was incorrect in his 2,300-day prophecy, wasn't he? Thought that Jesus was going to come in October uh, 1844. But think about this. Think about it. William Miller, even though he was incorrect, he was the instrument of the Lord. You see, without his work, even though it's incorrect, without his teaching of the 2300-day prophecy, the Seventh-day Adventist church would not have come into existence like it did. Hundreds of thousands of Christians committed their lives to the Lord, believing that the Lord was going to return in 1844. However, some lost faith after the great disappointment in 1844. They did not have enough oil in their lamps. But a remnant clung to Jesus just like Jacob did when he wrestled with him. The experience leading up to the great disappointment was the sweetest experience of their lives when they forsook all the cares of this world to prepare for the second coming. Even after the great disappointment, However, some of these people continued to study to see how they had misinterpreted the scriptures for they knew that the scriptures were true. And in continuing their study, these faithful followers rediscovered some important Bible truths that became the pillars of the faith that we share. 
and the truth in the Adventist message. We should emulate the studying habits of those early church pioneers and study the scriptures like the Bereans. We should forsake all known sin and completely surrender our lives to God, our creator and our sustainer and our redeemer. We should recognize that nothing in this short life on earth can compare with being with God in a sinless world for eternity with no death. Now, there's been many changes in the world in my lifetime. In fact, in just the last decade, there's been huge, huge changes. It totally amazes me that all the, of all the changes that have taken place in just the last couple years, our society is becoming more and more wicked. Laws are convoluted with politics. Laws are arbitrarily enforced. Morality has gone down the tubes. The entire world is on edge and virtually bankrupt. This nation and other nations can no longer make the claim that they are Christian nations. But we, we need to stay awake, we need to stay alert, we need to know what the Bible says, and we need to heed the warnings that God has given us over and over again. Otherwise, we'll be deceived or we'll just be lukewarm. We'll have a form of godliness like we studied in our Second Timothy scripture today. We'll have a form of godliness, but we'll be denying the power thereof. The exact year of Jesus' death is even debated. Most scholars believe that Jesus died anywhere from the year 29 A.D. or 31 A.D., but suffice it to say that the completion of 2,000 years is at our doorstep in the next uh, few years, 10 years. We cannot be positive of the time when Jesus returns, but regardless, we should be ready all the time. I've had uh, a couple friends that died in traffic accidents in the last year and a half. Gone. That can happen to us. Or we can die, it doesn't have to be a traffic accident. We know, do not know how much time we have on this earth. And so we need to live and be ready, ready all the time. Romans 13, 12 is our last text here in conclusion. God tells us, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let's bow our heads. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your precious, precious word that sometimes, maybe oftentimes, gets neglected. We pray, dear Lord, that you will help us as we study thy word, help us to understand. We pray that you will reveal things at the proper time to us. We pray, dear Lord, not only for us, but we pray for thy people throughout the world because we know that it's your will that no one be lost, but at the same time, many will be lost. And dear Lord, we pray that you'll use us, that you, you will help us to prioritize things in our life so that Bible study and our worship and, and our consecration to you will not be secondary or third or fourth or fifth in our life, but will be number one. Bless us, dear Lord. Help us to do thy will. And we pray that you'll just fill us with a double portion of your Holy Spirit. And we ask these things in accordance with thy holy will. And in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior and our Redeemer. Amen. Shall we bow our heads for the benediction? Father in heaven, we thank you for your manservant. We thank you for the message that was shared today with us. And now, Lord, we ask that you continue to help us to emulate you in everything that we do. As we leave this place, continue to grant, grant us traveling mercies to our various places and keep us ever true and faithful to you. These mercies we humbly ask in your son's name, with Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen.